Hi there, and welcome to PhD at Living. You learned about absolute zero in Gen Chem, right? Zero Kelvin! And don't let anybody you know say degrees Kelvin. <laughs> the temperature at which all molecular motion ceases. But can you do it? Can you actually achieve absolute zero? Spoiler, no. So feel free to stop watching. If you'd like a little more context though, including the current lowest temperature ever recorded, 38 picocalvins. Would you stop spoiling? The Celsius scale's reference standard being changed in 2019 and superconducting helium. Come on in. First, let's get our absolute temperature scale. The United States and 13 other countries, half of which you probably can't point to on a globe, use the Fahrenheit scale. But this is kind of a poor measure for absolute cold. 32 degrees Fahrenheit, which is where water freezes, equals zero degrees Celsius. Here's a fun thing. Some folks, especially in English-speaking countries, refer to the Celsius scale as the centigrade scale. Actually, this is technically incorrect. Under Celsius, the OG of a temperature scale using 0 and 100 for the freezing point and boiling point of water developed that scale in 1742. Celsius' original scale, however, had 0 as the boiling point and 100 as the freezing point of water. The first purported use of the reversed scale that we obviously still use today was by Carl Linnaeus, and it was apparently all the rage in Sweden around 1745. It took till 1948, however, for degree Celsius to officially become the nomenclature of choice. Here's another fun thing, and I promise I'm not trying to get you to purposefully stop watching this channel because of how ridiculous and pedantic it is. The degree Celsius and the Celsius scale in general used to be defined by absolute zero and the triple point of water using a reference material called Vienna Standard Mean Ocean Water. Yeah, that was a real thing. Anyway, in 2019, the SI units were redefined. This sounds more ominous than it was because the numbers didn't change, but how some values were defined or derived did. The temperature scale using our SI unit Kelvins was now defined by the now defined to be exact Boltzmann constant, which made the triple point of water now a measured value instead of a defined value. For what it's worth, the kilogram and the meter changed from being defined by actual objects, that is to say the literal kilogram and the literal meter, a thing that was just defined to be a meter long. That's for another fascinating video though. Back to scales. 32 degrees Fahrenheit is 0 degrees Celsius is 273.15 kelvins. The Kelvin scale was created to define absolute temperature, that is to say at 0 kelvins, temperature is 0 or it's the point at which, theoretically, all molecular motion stops. Okay, now we are finally ready to start talking about really cold temperatures. Starting with zero degrees C, of course, the freezing point of water. This is a science channel, so when possible, we're going metric. Sorry, not sorry. If you do want to change it to Fahrenheit, just multiply the number by 9 fifths and add 32, okay? Next on our list is dry ice, or solid carbon dioxide, at minus 78.5 degrees C. Next is the coldest temperature ever recorded on Earth, minus 100 degrees C. Where? Well, you can probably guess, on a ridge somewhere in Antarctica in the middle of the winter. Next we have liquid nitrogen at minus 196 degrees C. I used liquid nitrogen pretty frequently in grad school, mainly as the sacrificial coolant for our NMRs to keep the magnets cold. Liquid helium, now we're talking. Minus 269 degrees C, just four degrees above absolute zero. Liquid helium is a sweet molecule, but it is brutally cold, like cold straight through your huge thick insulated gloves cold. In grad school, I helped the professor refill the liquid helium in our NMRs every three months or so, and it was a pretty cool process. One time, accidentally, and with all my proper PPE on, I'll have you know, I got hit in the face with a burst of the helium. Luckily, the gas has very little thermal mass, so I didn't get frostbite or anything, but I did breathe a decent gulp of it, and when I exclaimed that I had done that, it came out, Hey, I think I got some helium. <sighs> Grad school. Chemically, making helium a liquid is really darn difficult. Helium is a noble gas, after all, so it has no interest in giving, taking, or sharing electrons with anything else, and its very small atomic size means it moves around like crazy. This means helium has very low inner atomic forces and has no desire to become a liquid. Nevertheless, if you eliminate nearly all molecular motion, that is, make it super cold, helium will start to behave and become a liquid. That, my friends, is at 4K. 
Once we get to 2.172K, however, the real fun starts. The helium, granted this is helium-4, because at these extremely low temperatures, the helium-3, which is a rare isotope but does exist, starts to separate out from the helium-4. How's that for some isotopic separation, huh? Manhattan Project, eat your heart out, eh? The helium starts to become a superfluid. What? Yes, at these crazy low temperatures, the helium acts as if it has no viscosity. This means when it runs along surfaces, it has no friction whatsoever and only stops when it stops itself. More specifically, let's go back to our legs of whiskey conversation. Remember that whiskey, basically just a mixture of ethanol and water, creates a surface tension gradient on the side of the glass and the ethanol preferentially climbs it. At least in part because of its viscosity, the ethanol, however, stops at some point and flows back down. Supercooled liquid helium does no such thing. Because it has no viscosity, the supercooled liquid helium is only impeded by its own critical velocity. In looking online, this critical velocity is basically the point at which gravity and air resistance equal each other. At any rate, liquid helium's critical velocity is fast. Fast enough to resist gravity, so in a glass, as long as the temperature of the system is maintained cold enough, the liquid helium will climb the glass, come outside, and start dripping from the bottom on its own. Pretty rad, huh? You think making liquid helium's hard? Try solid helium. Per its phase diagram, helium's still a liquid at absolute zero, so you have to get the pressure above about 25 atm for it to solidify. Probably the coldest temperature in the known universe is in the Boomerang Nebula in space. It's been ejecting gases at 300,000 miles per hour, no I didn't misspeak, for over 1,500 years. That adiabatic expansion has cooled the nebula to about 1 Kelvin, or minus 272.15 degrees C. And now the moment you've all been waiting for, even though I spoiled it at the beginning of the video, the coldest temperature ever. 38 picocalvins. Yes, I know I changed my scale, but if I wrote that in Celsius, it basically would look like absolute zero. And that just wouldn't be correct, would it? How could this be? How could somebody get so close to absolute zero? Let's talk about it. Step one. Take about 100,000 rubidium atoms and put them in a cylindrical magnetic trap on a microchip. No, I don't know what that means either. How much mass is 100,000 rubidium atoms? Well, wouldn't you know it, Avogadro's number finally comes in handy. 100,000 divided by Avogadro's number, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd, equals 1.66 times 10 to the negative 19 moles of rubidium. I didn't put my units here, so shame on me. This is 100,000 atoms divided by 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms per mole, so my unit that I end up with is moles. This many moles of rubidium times the atomic weight of rubidium, 85.4678 grams per mole, equals 1.42 times 10 to the negative 17 grams of rubidium. No, I can't really put that in context either. Femto is 10 to the minus 15, so it's 0 0.0142 femtograms of rubidium, or atto is 10 to the negative 18, so we can also express this as 14.2 atograms of rubidium. It turns out when you get a dilute enough concentration of a gas like this at a wicked low enough temperature, the individual atoms stop acting like a collection of single particles and start acting more like a single quantum entity that can be described by a wave function per that whole wave particle duality thing from quantum mechanics. This thing is the fabled Bose-Einstein condensate, or BEC. Step two. Cool the BEC by using magnetic lenses and shape vibrations to focus the wave particle thingies at infinity in all three dimensions. No, I don't know what that means either. I'm a chemist, not an atomic physicist. In this context, I think of temperature more in kinetic energy terms rather than well, degrees or something. If you lower the kinetic energy of something, you therefore lower the temperature. That is sort of the definition, after all. These Bose-Einstein condensate particles want to fly away and expand at each other, so if you lock them in place via this focusing thing in three dimensions, even though I have no idea how it works, you therefore lower the kinetic energy of that BEC and therefore lower the temperature. Step three, measure or detect the kinetic energy and therefore temperature of the BEC as it's in free fall expanding down a 110 meter drop tower in Germany. And that's really, whoa, 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 what? Yeah, so there's this really tall tower at the University of Bremen where they create microgravity environments. The BECs exist longer in microgravity rather than at ambient pressure conditions. So it gives experimenters longer time periods to make their measurements of temperature. <sighs> Fine. And that's the experiment. 
how to get the lowest temperature ever recorded by making 100,000 rubidium atoms behave like a wave and dropping them down a 300-some foot odd tower in Germany while focusing them at infinity. Yeah, didn't think I'd have that one checked off on the old bingo board either. And no, just in case you're wondering, you can't get something to absolute zero. Well, because in order to get something to absolute zero, you'd have to have something else that's already there. And even if it was, which it wouldn't be, you'd still have the quantum mechanical zero point energy, which is a great name for a ska band, and something that, again, I can't explain. I never took a quantum class. If you want the answer, go find some other qualified chemist on YouTube. Anyway, you can't get to absolute zero, so there. Well, there you have it, folks. Whether absolute zero is achievable, it isn't, and a bunch of other beautifully esoteric stuff. See you all next time. Anyway, I fell through some thin ice, and I'm telling you, water that cold, like right down there, it hits you like a thousand knives stabbing you all over your body.